And now for the last look. For all of Putin's outlandish claims of wanting to denazify Ukraine, his real aims have been evident from the start, turning the country into a puppet state and restoring some of the lost glory of the Soviet empire. But this war has shown how little Moscow has actually gotten from cultivating its own sphere of influence since the Soviet Union collapsed. After the Cold War, most of the former communist states in Europe took a fiercely anti-Russian stance and joined NATO or the European Union. Other countries, in Central Asia, for example, stayed in Moscow's orbit. In 1992, they formed the Collective Security Treaty Organization, or CSTO, Russia's counterpart to NATO. Current members are Armenia, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Tajikistan. In 2014, all those nations except Tajikistan joined Putin's answer to the European Union, the Eurasian Economic Union. These countries all trade heavily with Russia and host Russian bases or military facilities. In January, facing anti-government unrest, Kazakhstan's ruler called in CSTO troops. The mostly Russian forces helped restore order. In 2020, Armenia fought a bloody war with Azerbaijan. Russia brokered a truce and dispatched Russian soldiers to keep the peace. Yet despite these many connections, during Russia's war in Ukraine, it has gotten almost nothing from Armenia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Tajikistan. None have contributed troops or supplies. According to NBC, Kazakhstan refused a Russian request for troops, though Kazakhstan denies a request was ever made. Whatever the case, it's all a remarkable contrast to the immense help Ukraine has gotten from countries it has no formal alliance with. Even Kazakhstan has sent humanitarian aid to Ukraine. Of course, these Central Asian countries are small and couldn't offer much material support to Russia anyway, but you would expect them to stand with Moscow in the court of international opinion. Instead, as The Economist points out, they have generally maintained neutrality. They've made carefully worded statements or stayed silent. None have recognized the breakaway republics in Donbass. They all abstained in the main UN votes condemning Russian aggression though most of them did vote to keep Russia in the UN Human Rights Council. Belarus is the one country that has given Russia major assistance. The two nations enjoy a special relationship, having agreed in 1999 to form a so-called union state. In 2020, when massive protests threatened to topple Belarusian dictator Alexander Lukashenko, Putin came to his rescue with financing and the promise of troops. So over the last few months, Lukashenko has let Russia use his territory as a staging ground for invading Ukraine. Belarus has also consistently voted with Russia in the UN. But Belarus hasn't entirely acted as a Russian vassal. Like the Central Asian countries, it hasn't recognized the breakaway Donbass republics. More importantly, it has ruled out sending its own troops to Ukraine. Think about how different all this is from the heyday of the Soviet Union. In Moscow's misadventure in Afghanistan, the Kremlin could mobilize material and manpower from across the Soviet republics. In quashing the Prague Spring of 1968, the Soviet Union received military support from Bulgaria, Poland, and Hungary. The real story here may be the divide between the rulers and the public in these pro-Moscow states. For example, the Belarusian dictator depends on the military to stay in power. Analysts believe if Lukashenko sends his troops to die in Russia's war, he could lose the military support and lose control of his country. And lose control of his country. Why? Because only 3% of Belarusians want Belarus to actively participate in the war. Belarusian activists have repeatedly sabotaged their country's railway system, hobbling Russia's ability to move men and equipment. This is the kind of ally Putin is likely to get, even if he prevails in Ukraine, a repressive government in Kyiv with little popular support and thus limited capacity to help Russia. Because at the end of the day, even in dictatorships, the voice of the people matters.